So I'm Malika. I work with the innovation team here at UNDP. I'm here with my colleague Gemma, who's also the innovation team. And at UNDP, we've already started testing blockchain. We are working in Montenegro, testing what blockchain can do for remittance transfers. Uh, sorry, in Serbia, I apologize. Uh, we're also using blockchain for fleet management. We want to see what this technology can do for us. Uh, we see colleagues from other agencies here who have also started some blockchain experiments. So we're very excited to have you in the room. And we love having Ben in the room. Um, who works on social impact and really bridging the gap between technology and humanitarians and policymakers like us. So Ben, I'm actually going to hand over to you in a moment. Uh, so you can take us through it and let us know if we can do Q&A at the end or through the Absolutely. presentation. Through the presentation. Because through we're this. like blockchain 101 here. So how many people know about blockchain? Let's put, do a raise of... Oh, this is excellent. Maybe we're like two or two. So how many people have tested blockchain in their projects? Excellent. And project. It's a token. Uh, Ether token. Yeah. But you're just using your Ether token. We are building the project. So. Okay, so we're between a one and two. We've heard of blockchain and we want to know more. Great. Cool. Is there a clicker? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, feel free to ask questions at any point. It's a lot more fun when it's interactive and I don't like lecturing. Um, all right. So because we do have some people in the room who have heard of blockchain, uh, it's usually the most fun to start with asking somebody to explain blockchain. Does anybody want to take a stab? <laughs> any takers? All right. Completely understandable. Fair enough. Um, I once was asked to give someone like a Roman gladiatorial style life or death situation on if they could get it right. Um, they seem very scared. So what is a blockchain? Um, blockchain is a ledger. Ledgers have been around since ancient Sumeria. They're just places where we record things. Um, uh, what a blockchain does is it takes that idea of a ledger and it cryptographically secures it and makes it permanently verifiable. Um, so it exists, uh, if you think about the way current digital ledgers work, they exist on a server, um, which means you can go into a data center, you can go into a computer with the Raspberry Pi that server is hosted, and you can take it out. Um, you can just like physically get rid of it. There's not a lot of, uh, maybe we'll, we'll wait for people. Okay. <laughs> So for those who are online, we're taking a pause because we have a couple more people in the room and we are now restarting. If we're going to restart, I will actually maybe take a stab at starting with who I am to kind of set the stage for this. Um, my name is Ben. I work for an organization called Consensus. We are one of the we are the largest Ethereum blockchain kind of development studios on planet Earth. Um, I was employed 50. We have about 500 something now. That's weird. Um, please don't grow that fast, even though I'm sure you guys are much larger. Um, what we do, uh, we kind of do, just to give a quick intro, we build out decentralized applications on top of the Ethereum blockchain while also working with large organizations, um, Fortune 50s, Fortune 500s, governments, to build like enterprise-style software solutions, the same you would see with um, a more traditional software company. Um, we also have a VC fund that invests in blockchain solutions, and we have uh, an academy arm which is dedicated to just educating people about blockchain and kind of what it means. Um, I have the coolest job in the company in that I was one of the founders and am still one of the leads on our social impact team at Consensus. So I kind of sit in the middle of all four of those other arms um, and get to say like, hey, this is pretty cool. How can we help people with it? What can we do? And I'm just allowed to run around and chase good ideas, um, which is awesome. So taking that into back to what is a blockchain with all the new people in here, who has heard of blockchain? Who has heard of Bitcoin? Ethereum? Anybody explain the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin? <coughs> cool, we'll get there. So what is a blockchain? A blockchain is a ledger, that's it. Like It's just like your traditional ledger, the same way we've been writing ledgers since Sumerians were writing cuneiform on clay pots. Um, it's just a place to store information. What a blockchain does is it takes that information and it, first and foremost, it decentralizes it. 
So right now, if you think about ledgers, they tend to be located in one place. Um, you have uh, an Excel spreadsheet that lives on a computer. It's stored, that Excel spreadsheet is stored on the server. That server is in a data center in northern Norway. Um, cool, super energy inefficient, and super, like, it's really easy to get rid of that. Um, not really, but kind of. So what decentralization does is it takes that information, and as opposed to having it stored in a single place, which that place is a form of failure, um, it takes it and it spreads it out across the entire network. So the way blockchains work is there are these things called nodes. And what a node is, is it's just a computer that's running a blockchain, and it stores the entire amount of data on the blockchain on that computer. Um, right now, with the Ethereum blockchain, there's about 22,000 nodes across planet Earth. Um, and the whole chain is about, is about 16 gigabytes of information total. Um, that's expanding rapidly. That's changing. We recently had something called CryptoKitties explode onto the scene, which I'm sure some of you have heard. Um, and that's a perfect example of why blockchains are not super production ready yet, and that we had a Pokemon-like game crash the system, um, just because we're still scaling. And that's that's really important as we dive into the rest of this conversation. So we take our, our immutable ledger, and because it's decentralized, it's stored on these 22,000 nodes across the world. If you want to delete all the information, you have to go like physically destroy each one of those 22,000 computers. Yes, that's doable. Is any organization going to spend the time or effort to do that? Probably not. Um, there are other risks to a blockchain. There are things called 51% attacks, which is where you basically manufacture more computing power to take over control of the system. Because the way a blockchain works is that uh, it's a shared source of truth between all of the information on the chain. So if you're running a node, you trust the information on that node, on that blockchain, because all of the other nodes are validating it as true. So I can say my name is Ben. Um, actually, there's, there's a really good way to do this, which is there's, what, 35 of us in here? Um, I say my name is Ben. I know Gemma previously. Gemma, Gemma validates that my name is Ben. So we've got a source of truth that says, OK, we agree that my name is Ben. Um, you guys are acting on the system. You see that Gemma is saying that you're trusting it, because that's what you know. So now we have a much broader <coughs> shared source of truth that my name is Ben, because there's 35 people in this room who say that my name is Ben. We're pretty secure in that. And if now Gemma says my name is not Ben, well, you guys may listen to her because she was the first person to start it. That's not how a blockchain would work. In a blockchain-based system, you guys would all basically say, like, OK, she can believe that, but that doesn't mean anything. We're going to move on without that. Um, she has to convince every person in this room that my name is not Ben to change that truth. That's another reason why blockchains are secure. Um, if you want to go in and change any information that's on that ledger, you have to change every bit of information that came before it to reflect that most recent change before the next block is mined. So before the next set of transactions are verified, you have to change every amount, every piece of data in the chain before it to reflect that new change. Um, that's what we call a 51% attack, which is when you could go in and manufacture enough computing power to actually be able to do that. Um, yeah. How do you know that you have 50% uh, power on the network? Since so you would, centralized network. Well, you so if you think about it, there's, there's 22,000 Ethereum nodes right now. Um, if you had 22,000 and what you manufactured 22,000 in one, you would have to the last one or two is rough. It changes. It's not, this is not a like actual feasible thing that you'll do. Um, like, could the US government or the Russian government go out and manufacture enough computing power to take over a public blockchain? Yes. Are they going to? No. Um, and then the more adopted this becomes, as we kind of see the technology grow and expand, what we will see is we'll see a lot more, um, a lot more security in the system based off the fact that more people are using it. That's the strength. It is at its core, it is a grassroots decentralizing, distributing technology. Um, that brings us to smart contracts. Um, or we, we can go into public private key cryptology, but that may be too technical. Um, anybody have any interest in learning about like the really nitty gritty as to why blockchains are secured on a technical level? Great, awesome, thank you. Um, so what is a smart contract? So this is where we kind of get, we go into the difference between the original blockchain, Bitcoin, and the newer ones, like Ethereum. Um, so a smart contract, or Bitcoin, is peer-to-peer -peer decentralized cash. It's a great way to send and store value on a distributed ledger, but again, it really only works as a cashless payment system. Um, and it's a very narrow set of use cases. It is, it's money. Like, please don't let people tell you that Bitcoin is like has use beyond just being a way to store and transfer value. Um, Ethereum or Ethereum is a is a it takes the 
precedent of Bitcoin and that decentralized network of it, a distributed network of it, and it applies these things called smart contracts to it. What a smart contract is, it's business logic. So really simply, it's if X, then Y, you can program a, a, set of, a set of values that when achieved, an action occurs. So that takes the Bitcoin network or the idea of a blockchain and takes it from just being this peer-to-peer -peer cashless payment system, turns it into a software platform the same way an iOS system is or you know, Windows 10 is. Um, you can start to build applications on top of it that do things. Like you can create uh, systems that automatically send fund, that funds are triggered and sent when a certain variable is met. Um, so if a report is triggered by an IoT sensor, that can initiate a contract, which then sends funds to 200 people across the globe. And that's kind of the core of blockchain's power is that you, with smart contracts, you automatically are starting to enable um, really quick, cheap interactions between individuals based on defined variables that they set up as individuals. So with proper infrastructure, you and I could go out, we could set up a smart contract that says, X is going to happen when these variables are met. That can be just about anything, but there are still technological problems being sorted out. And it's really important to understand that public blockchains like Ethereum are, like we're talking about a two and a half year old child. We know, we have an idea of what it's gonna look like when it grows up, but it is still waddling around in diapers and struggling to walk and talk. Um, so we're getting there, but there's a lot of growing to be done. And that's why, especially in the social impact sector, it's really, really important that we're very careful with this technology. Um, do no harm is something that we should do our best to drive for with new technology. I'm not super sure that it's possible. Um, unfortunately, I think that we are going to cause problems as we start to deploy technology on the ground in new places and new ways. Um, but we need to make sure that we understand the way that this technology works with vulnerable populations on the ground, whatever. Um, it's boring, boring, cool. So what, is, what does this mean at a much larger scale for the world as a whole? Like if we talk about blockchain, the end goal of blockchain is creating a decentralized internet. Um, so think about the internet that uh, started out as this way for people to share information. The genesis was we're gonna, we're gonna create this, this just global information network that everyone's gonna have access to. Um, web 1.0 kind of got to web 2.0, which is the dot-com bubble. And then Facebook, Amazon, whatever, where we started to see a lot of our data and information, the way we were able to share information was controlled by large organizations, was controlled by, uh, you know, does anybody know how much money Facebook makes off your account every year? How many people in this room have Facebook accounts? Everyone, cool, almost everyone. Anyways, if you have a Facebook account, Facebook is making $16.2 per year off your account just by your account existing. That's it. They completely control your data and are completely financially dependent on your data, but you guys get nothing in return. Um, so what we have with blockchain is kind of this ability to create more peer-to-peer -peer connections uh, surrounding something called self-sovereign identity, which is uh, identity that's created, formed, owned by you as an individual because you exist, as opposed to uh, UNHCR giving you a refugee identity or the United States government giving you a passport. So all of us are humans, we're all here, we have licenses, we have passports, that's our form of identity. Um, we are people because the government says we are people. Any qualms, any feelings about that, disagreements? Um, we're, we're people because the government agrees that we're people. Um, um, they say, I think I exist, it's not mm -hmm. because of the government, it's, yeah. it's just because I'm here. So you have, um, it's fine for us in the States, we can trust maybe less now, we can trust that our government is not going to cause problems because we don't control our identity. Um, uh, we tend to believe, at least I tend to believe, that when you look at a lot of the problems across the globe, they all kind of jump back to that identity point where no matter who you are, if you're an unbaked person in Kenya, or you are a, 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 a child laborer in Moldova, or you're being sex trafficked in Moldova, or you are an underfunded worker or a Rohingya in Bangladesh, you are vulnerable because you don't have an identity because the government doesn't give you an identity. You are not viewed as a person because the government doesn't want to be this person. And when your identity is controlled by an outside entity, there's a lot of problems that can arise. Um, it's happened throughout history. I don't think I need to you know, go too much into the historical depth about why identity is important. So because blockchains create this digital ledger, this permanent record, um, and with smart contracts, what we are now able to do 
what we think we're able to do, and we're getting close, but again, baby technology, we're still growing. Um, it's really, really important that we step away from the hype around the technology and talk about what it is as a piece of technology, because unfortunately that doesn't happen quite enough in this space. Um, the concept of self-sovereign identity is the like key component to blockchain, um, especially using blockchain to help people. Because we can create this record of interactions, we can create this um, these contracts that initiate actions, you start to build reputations around yourself based on the way you've interacted with other people, based on the way you've interacted with uh, banks, other organizations, whatever you want. Your identity starts to come back to you. You're not a human because the government says you're human. You're human because you've done things. You are the sum of all of the actions you've taken. Gives us a lot more leeway. Um, in the lens of student loans in the States, uh, I could be 25 years old, I could have paid all my student loans off every month on time, full amount for the last four years, and then all of a sudden I get sick and I don't have the money to do that because I'm paying medical bills. What does that do to your credit score for the rest of your life? Kills it. You are, for no fault of your own, because you got sick and need to spend money to support yourself and make sure that you are healthy, you are going to have difficulty getting a mortgage, you're going to have difficulty renting an apartment, you're going to have difficulty starting a business for the rest of your life. That's not fair. Um, that's not right. That's not fair. I don't think there's any disagreement about that. Then we are not, uh, we should not be punished for unfortunate events outside of our hands. In a blockchain based system, if it's well designed and it works properly, what would happen is uh, in that same scenario, people would be able to say, like, hey, Ben's paid off his loans every month for the past three months. Some event happened, I don't know what it is, but I think we can give him a break. He has proven himself to be a trustworthy person. His identity, his reputation is that of a trustworthy person. Something has happened, we'll, we'll cut him some slack. Something happens again, reputation starts to change. It builds up over time and you're developing a reputation based on the actions you are actually taking as opposed to some arbitrary role of events that look bad. Um, and this identity concept plays into just about any blockchain for social impact solution you're going to start talking about. Um, UNDP's product in Serbia, there is a pretty heavy identity component of it. Um, World Food Program's pilot in Jordan, there's a super heavy identity component of it. Uh, we're still talking about centralized access points where in both those cases the UN is the identity manager for those civilians, which is for now fine. I don't think we have any qualms about the UN being control of people's identities, but longer term we want to step away from that. We want to empower everyone to have control of their identity, or at least have the opportunity to control their identity. So if we can build these identities and people don't want to manage them, they can hand them over to a trusted third party and say like, hey, like I don't feel I'm comfortable managing this for one reason or another, probably has to do with security of private keys, which are your access points to the blockchain and your reputation, um, kind of like a pin number to gain access to who you are. That's one of the issues we're having with self-sovereign identity is how do we protect people's identities when they are on the ground in dangerous places. Um, cool. Is everyone cool with the concept of self-sovereign identity? Questions, comments, concerns? I'm, not, I'm sorry, but it's, it's fine. I'm not sure I follow your examples because I mean I understand the problem with the student credit here mm -hmm. and with the health system, that's very clear. How is that related to identity? There are a lot of countries also just let, let me there are a lot of countries where you know you're allowed to be sick, you know, the state ex care of you and it's relatively inexpensive to study. So I mean it's not really because the state controls the identity or not. On the other hand, in this kind of system, so I mean like a state is tracing your identity from birth, right? They know who you are, they know for example how many times you, you went to prison or you didn't go to prison, which is something that is very important in building your reputation. So when an adult, I assume, enter the system, what does the system know about the adult if it's not through interaction with the already existing database? Like a criminal can enter there yeah. and have a perfectly good reputation because well, he didn't do anything wrong. Chances are they would be onboarded over a period of time and if we maneuver from a government system to a self-sovereign system, by the way, none of this is gonna happen in the next 20 years. Like We're not gonna see a self-sovereign identity <laughs> system that stays in the next 20 years. What we are starting to do is build out identity systems that take the place of banking, uh, banking identities. So there's 2.6 billion people on planet Earth who don't have access to bank accounts. They don't have access to bank accounts because they don't have an identity that's given them by the government one way or another. Um, uh, on the island of, uh, I'm blanking on the name, Southern Philippines, there's about 18 million indigenous people 
who do not have access to the economy. They don't have access to their natural resources. They have no ability to capitalize on what amounts to about $2 trillion in natural capital on their lands. Financial inclusion is probably the first place we're gonna see these identities come into play. Um, we're gonna start being able to connect people to the economy on a peer-to-peer -peer level as opposed to a, a bank level. Take banks out of the system, start to engage at a much more equal distributed level and you bring more people into markets, you create new markets. In the lens of someone coming onto the system and having a previous criminal record, that's one of the things that we have to think about. How do we onboard people onto the system? Like, like, what we're talking about here is only going to work if it starts at birth and every action you've ever taken at birth is built up on top of that. But you already have digital identities that follow you everywhere. Um, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, like there's a reason why I go on my phone and look at Nick's tickets and then my Facebook says on my computer, like, hey, you wanna buy a Nick's ticket? Like, we're followed by that information. Everything we do online is already recorded. Our identities um, are managed and other organizations benefit from them. So yes, we could start onboarding people and if the government doesn't say like, this person has a criminal record, they're going to you know, get a clean slate on blockchain. Um, other people around them could say like, yeah, like no, this person's a criminal and that would start to show, those attestations would start to show up. But at a much earlier level, much more important level, um, access to your own data online. Right, like again, the same way that governments control who you are as a person with your driver's license, Facebook, has access to all of your data because you are, like, uh, you you belong to Facebook. Your Facebook identity belongs to Facebook. Your Facebook profile is on a Facebook server. Facebook could delete that server. Your Facebook would cease to exist. All the benefits you gain from that Facebook are gone. In a blockchain-based system, if we talk about a decentralized Facebook, and um, there's advertising, on, there's ads on Facebook. That's where Facebook makes their money. And I'm sorry, this is really all hypothetical, but it tends to just be the best way to talk about this. Yeah. Description of the identity reminded me of this um, series on Netflix called Black Mirror. Yes, I absolutely. Um, I recommend it to anyone. Um, it's very interesting and it imagines the world um, in the future with um, emerging technologies and how they can uh, take a life of its own, basically. So there's one episode in Black Mirror where everyone has a number, right? And so if you jaywalk and someone almost hits you, they can point their phone at you and give you one star, right? If you're super sweet to someone, they can give you five stars, right? And so all of this is aggregated, like with what you're saying, every single thing you do in your day yeah. is aggregated, right? And into a number which then enables you to either buy a house, if you're under a certain number, you can't get a mortgage, or you can't even rent a proper car, and it's a very, and what happened was the society had this downward spiral, really, because of it. Not only this woman as a person, but social, it changed social interactions. Like everyone became basically fake, right? And it had all these other implications. So when these technologies are being tested, and they're very, you know, when you're talking about it, it's very inspiring and interesting, the wave of the future. But if, you know, who's thinking about the risks? Um, because once you do it, you can't pull back from it, right? Absolutely. And then once it's out there, it's just up to people to just, it takes on a life of its own. So one of the really interesting big points that you're bringing up is the fact that there's no precedent for anything like this. Like there's no precedent for like true control over yourself in human history, um, which means that we shouldn't build anything until we've done an incredible amount of research on what this is gonna do to societies. How are people gonna interact with it? How are people gonna touch this? Um, my big project at the moment is uh, research and design onto what a blockchain tool will look like for international development. So how do we get funds from UN agencies, from other donors, onto the ground, into Nigeria to fund uh, oil spill cleanups? Pretty big issue there with corruption in the region. There's a significant amount of funds that are lost. It all actually stems from a UN report. Um, there's a huge identity aspect of this. Like The workers at the ground are not getting paid because they're able to be cut out of the system because they don't have identities. Um, Putting that aside, blockchain is something that, what it does by nature, by creating new links between individuals, you're changing the way we interact. Um, creating reputation systems, creating visible reputation systems is going to change the way we interact with each other, and we don't know how yet. We can talk about the best case scenario, we can talk about the worst case scenario, we don't know what's actually gonna happen. Um, there is so much research and development that needs to be done in collaboration with humanitarian organizations, with impact investors, with all the necessary stakeholders in this. Um, 
to avoid exactly what you're talking about. There is a, there's a problem in the blockchain space right now that no one wants to talk about the negative outcomes of something. Nobody wants to talk about the negative potential of what we're trying to build. Um, ledgers of identity have gone wrong throughout history, so now what happens when a government has a permanent ledger of identity in every interaction you've ever had? That's terrifying. Um, for like so many countless obvious reasons, we could be building stuff that could make stuff a lot worse. Uh, what that means, at least to me, and kind of what my job is, is to talk to people like you guys, bring the technology to policymakers, to people who are working on the ground in humanitarian spaces, who understand the way that societies work, but may not understand the way technology works. Um, as we move forward and kind of begin to design these systems, we need to be able to work with you guys to sit down and say, this is a problem you guys are facing. We have a technology that we may think would be able to solve it. Let's narrow this use case down. Awesome. We've got a use case. Now we need to spend three months together researching, thinking about the way this is going to interact with people on the ground. How is this going to change the society we deploy this in? How is creating you know, multifaceted markets in a society that doesn't have a sense of saving going to change that? So like, what does that mean, both positives and negatives? And if at the end of that three months, we aren't able to definitively say or make a, a pretty solid assumption that this is beneficial, we shouldn't build that. Um, we don't want to build an identity system. We don't want to put an identity system in the hands of the Syrian regime, in the hands of North Korea. Um, we need to be careful with what we build. Like, like obviously, that's something that we just don't want to do. And, and I think, I think we, as a technology space, and, and blockchain is at its core. Like, it came out of the Occupy movement. Satoshi's uh, the white paper, the Bitcoin white paper, was 2007, 2008, in direct response to the financial collapse and the the, the wealth gap. Like that's what it's about. Blockchain was invented as a system to distribute wealth equity across the globe, but it's going to be co-opted if we don't work together to make sure that that is the future. Um, what's the difference between a tool and a weapon? Yep. Uh, so, uh, to set the game, initially Facebook wasn't created to buy our identity or yeah. to distribute it as well. So who owns now blockchain? Who puts money in it right now, and what are the chances that one day it will be also bought by so, someone, possibly Syrian regime, or not? Um, it doesn't matter. Facebook is not bought by Syrian regime, but it doesn't mean it's better. Blockchain um, owns itself. Um, it's not owned by a human being. Um, so, but who puts money? Who, who pays the salary? Pays my salary? Yes. My boss. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, that's no, separate. For that, like, but I don't mean exactly. So, like, where, where is money coming from? That's my question. Um, all right, so now we're going to the money side of things. Bitcoin has value as a store of value. People are storing money in Bitcoin. There's FOMO. There's a, there's, oh, there can only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. There's nothing back in it other than the fact that people say Bitcoin has value. Right? Like, like Bitcoin's at, what, $17,000 right now? That's $17,000 because the rest of the population has decided that a single Bitcoin is worth $17,000. Um, there's, there's also proof of work in the chain itself that there, that proves that has some work has been done in order to produce those Bitcoins. So, so there's kind of proof. That's that so, so proof it, right? miners are paid in Bitcoin for verifying the transactions on chain because in order for something to have value, in order for work to have value, you have to be paid. So the mining mechanism, uh, the way it's built and the way new Bitcoins are generated, the people who are, the, the, it's not the people, it's actually the computers who are doing the generating. Those computers are rewarded for verifying the transactions on chain. The people who own those computers are the people who are in control of the Bitcoin that come out of that mining process. However, that's distributed. There are countless Bitcoin mines across planet Earth, Bitcoin computers, mining Bitcoin. Um, no one person owns a majority of those. So there's no there's no one who can just step in and say, like, I'm going to control this system because I have access to all the miners. Um, because I, can, I, as an individual, can walk out of this building, walk into Best Buy, buy a bunch of GPUs, and build my own Bitcoin miner, and have the ability to be part of the system, be part of the network. And by doing that, I'm actually making it more robust and more secure against someone coming in and saying, I'm going to take control of this. Ethereum has value because Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer cash and payment system and it's the price is driven by supply and demand and very much so by the fact that there's a huge amount of fear of missing out because people are making a lot of money. Um, that's it. Bitcoin is boring. Bitcoin does one thing and it does one thing only and it makes it pretends to be money. Um, Ethereum is a software platform. The Ether token that is the, the store of value for Ethereum, uh, it's not 
money is a fuel. If you want to initiate one of those smart contracts we talked about earlier on an Ethereum blockchain, you actually have to burn a little bit of Ether. You have to burn a, a token. You have to burn price to make that transaction go through. The miners in Ether get paid for verifying that that transaction is going through. The same way it happens in, in Bitcoin. But Ether is a fuel. It's a fuel for a platform the same way that petrol is fuel for your car. It doesn't run without it. If you want to do something on chain without having money, you're not going to have it. What that means is that the system has to have its own amount of funds into it so these transactions can be verified without me having to pay for them myself. And just to, just, uh, just to make sure that I understand it, this means that all the features of Ether are based on the system of money that underlies it, which is Ether. Ethereum? So the cryptocurrency, if part of it. It's not a currency, of, it's a fuel. Or the fuel, whatever you want to call it. It's a payment uh, methodology to the network, to the, to the miners. It, it right? runs the network. Yeah. yeah. So I pay those numbers to for the miners as fees. As so you're paying fees to the miners to validate the system. So it's a payment method between me as a user of Ethereum to the miners. But is putting gasoline into your engine and pressing the acceleration of the yeah, mechanism, or is it? So what I mean is that the, the, the core functionality of the Ether and the Bitcoin are the same, which is basically this kind of fuel. No, because you can't, there's no smart contracts on Bitcoin. You can't build a self-sovereign identity on Bitcoin. You can't build a, 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 a preemptive insurance yet. You can't build a preemptive insurance tool on Bitcoin. You can't, build a, you can't build a system like the World Food Program's pilot on the Bitcoin blockchain. I see. Um, those contracts, the smart contracts, are what make the different. Are the different? I'm, I'm not sure what they mean by smart contracts, but I think Bitcoin has smart contracts, but it's limited. It's, it's limited uh, because it's, it does not. It's not complex like the Ether. One. So, and um, for example, I can do multi sig addresses on Bitcoin. Yes, right? it's kind of a smart contract. Then. Kind of. So, but not. And the risk of getting too technical. Um, Ethereum smart contracts are built in a language called Solidity, yes. and Solidity is a Turing complete language. Yeah. That means. Complex. It can do everything a computer can do as a language. That's what a smart contract is. A smart contract is like a program, it's a computer that sits on top of the system, basically. Bitcoin doesn't have that. But that yeah. it's relatively irrelevant to the point, to this broader conversation. Um, yeah. One question yeah, about can identity. Can I just do a temperature check, just one second? So I can see a lot of very confused faces, and I know blockchain is a vocabulary unto itself. Yeah. So what I did want to do was actually um, get a sense from the room if it's okay that we actually move towards more applications, mm -hmm. things that we can see on the ground, That's right. what has worked, what hasn't. Just so as a room, we can move forward, and then if you have uh, more technical conversations and Q and A, which I already have done as well. Uh, we can leave that to the last 10 minutes. Is that okay? So I'm just assuming, is that all right? Okay. Is that okay with you, Ben, as well? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, okay. I'm going to put this down. Okay. Um, in the humanitarian sector, the like best current applicable tool, and I'm sorry, you ended P for. No, I, I didn't. Don't worry. Just so okay. so we can see you. Um, the World Food Programs Building Blocks pilot is like the coolest thing you're operating on the ground right now. Um, they built a system that basically goes in and when the refugees at Adelaide in the camp go to the supermarket and they scan their eyes, um, it initiates, the smart contracts initiated that verifies that transaction on chain. Funds are taken, called, there are a couple funds that are called from the WFP's reserve, whatever it is, deposited directly into the supermarket and that's paid for the transaction. All that they did, super simply, is they took the system and the way that the cash transfers were delivered previously, and they took the Jordanian bank and said, we are losing a lot of money in transaction fees at this specific point. We can cut that out. Super, super simple, super basic. They literally took a bank and said, we don't need you. Um, they don't. They're running it. They're, their pilot was ran from May until December. 10,000 refugees being fed daily. Saving two hundred thousand dollars a month for aid to be redistributed. That's awesome. That's the type of thing we should be focusing on. Like, what is the lowest hanging fruit? How can we cut out banks? How can we reduce transaction fees? How can we verify that uh, things are being things are events are happening? That's where the technology is at right now. That's um, all. Sorry, Ben. That's all. Um, uh, all the transactions that are performed in Ether. Or? No. So that's it's it's actually run on a private chain. Um, so there's no cryptocurrency involved in this. The, the transactions, um, it's closed loop. So the funds are never in the hands of anybody. They're kind of, they actually never really leave the, 
the World Food Programs Reserve. When the iris guard, when the scanner scans, when the refugee scans their eyes, it initiates the transaction. The, the, the iris guard, the piece of IoT tech, calls the World Food Program and says, hey, this is verified. We know that this happened. The World Food Program pays the supermarket for that transaction. Um, as opposed to the current system, the so previous system, which was that it had to get verified through the Jordanian bank, and they were losing their paying bank transactions at two separate points. They, they pay in, uh, in Jordanian dollars at the end. Yeah, or they're paying in USD, whatever it is. It's not, it's not currency. Nope. You know, you don't need cryptocurrency in a blockchain. Like, one of the big things we need to do in 2018 as, a, as like a technology space is completely disassociate cryptocurrency and blockchain a lot of the time. There are some use cases where it's very applicable, you do not need a cryptocurrency in every blockchain solution. Yep. Yeah, stemming from that, say, like you said, you were creating a, a token based off Ether. Is this pegged to the Ether price then? Yeah, so. It's kind highly of. volatile. If you're, so. if you're creating a token based off Ether, you're creating something called an ERC20 token, which is a, it's movable and it's verifiable by the Ethereum chain, but it's like almost like tokenized equity. So it actually, the price actually acts more um, as a result of the market. It acts more like Bitcoin than like Ether in that sense. And it's volatile for different reasons, not because of the price of Ether. It's volatile because, you know, why are stocks, why can stocks be volatile? It kind of functions the same way. That a token does. You can create things called stable tokens, which are pegged to a certain price. They're generally pegged to a trad traditional currency. Um, we're going to see a lot of that in 2018, specifically in places like Nigeria, where we need a way to get money securely into the country, but they also need to be able to spend the funds. Um, I think one of the problems and one of the reasons why people in the development sector shouldn't focus on tokenized economies is because all of a sudden you need to recreate the entire like payment system in the region. You need to be at, you need, there needs to be a point of service or a point of sale that accepts tokens. There needs to be accessibility to whatever form of wallet those tokens are held into. So what we really should be focusing on now is if we're talking about payment systems or putting money in the hands of people, how do we make sure that most money is ending up in the hands of people and you're not losing a lot to transaction fees? Um, that's like, well, that's the lowest hanging fruit. And, and I personally believe that if we want to help people the most of blockchain over the next year as the technology itself develops and infrastructure develops, we should just focus on making organizations more efficient, more transparent, um, and able to disperse aid better. We don't really necessarily need to be building for the beneficiaries on the ground because we don't know how they're going to use the technology. We don't know the problems that are going to arise. You guys are a much safer experiment bed for the technology. Like I, I'm not worried about WFP, you know, their transaction fee harming refugees. The refugees have no idea that anything has changed. That's the way it should be. We shouldn't be changing. We shouldn't be directly changing the lives of people. And if we are, we really need to understand uh, what that means for for everything. So let's focus on efficiency for you guys for the next year or two. Um, international development, like with our project in Nigeria, um, that's a really big step for this space. We're not building anything. We are informing the design and helping people understand what this may look like. We are working with people on the ground to understand the way they may interact with the system, but we're learning. Like I cannot stress that enough that we as a space are learning the same, like we're learning as much about what you guys do and the way that beneficiaries are aided, the way the internet works, as much as you guys learn about blockchain. Um, it's really important that we don't act as competitors to each other, that we don't believe that aid is you're right and we're a private sector organization that should stay out of it. Um, we are firm believers in collaboration. We want to be in the rooms with you guys as you guys are talking about policy and we want you guys in the rooms with us as we talk about technology. Conversations need to be had in a way that informs everybody um, and we're not just having one-sided conversations because one-sided conversations lead to one-sided solutions. One-sided solutions aren't solutions. Um, sometimes they're band-aids, but they break. We need to be cognizant of the fact that we should be working together. Um, I cannot stress enough, if you guys are building a blockchain project, if you guys are building any sort of technological, any sort of innovation project, please don't let it be structured as a UN team and a development team. Please have it be one team made up from people from both organizations working together every day on calls, working together. Um, we're not gonna be able to understand both sides if we don't do that. And if we don't understand both sides, it's not gonna work. Um, and that's just like a really, maybe a little bit of a personal projection there about some of my problems 
with both sides. But I think also what they're saying aligns with the decentralization nature of those networks, yeah. so those technologies that, uh, that if you think about Bitcoin or Ether, it's a huge decentralized network that everybody is working with. Absolutely. They, and they don't realize that it's a, it's, a, it's just they're all under, under the umbrella of Bitcoin. And if you create a project here, it has to have the decentralized nature of it. That's, um, that's exactly what they're saying, which is um, cool. And I know on another really cool use case on the topic of efficiency is a little bit more governance focus by Estonia, E-Estonia. Does anybody know a lot about E-Estonia? E-Estonia is freaking sweet. It's so cool. Um, they, it's not a public blockchain. It's a private blockchain. It's centralized. Who cares? Um, if I want to go out and register a business, I have to go to like seven different US agencies to like get all this paperwork signed, and it can take what three, four, five months, maybe three weeks if you're lucky. Um, e Estonia, everyone has a digital identity. It's government issued. It's fine, whatever. They log onto a web portal. They input their information. It, I think the I think their private blockchain is called X Roads, X Force. Um, you log on. It initiates funds of con. You put your information in. It initiates funds of contracts. Those contracts call the relevant agencies, pull all the relevant information. And you have bought a house, traded a land title, registered a business in 20 minutes. Is that already working? Yeah, or? yeah, that works. So <laughs> yes, Sony is live. It, they are moving more and more of a two blockchain. Um, they it, one of the things about private blockchains, the blockchain is that you can basically recreate a private blockchain system without an actual blockchain because it's controlled and it's permissioned, so it's not actually decentralized. Um, but it, it's a really cool project, and, and I think. Um, as far as governance goes, we're not going to see major organizations, major governments start to explore blockchain as government. Like, there's not a doubt in my mind uh, that the US government will be 20 years behind on this stuff. Uh, but we're starting to see smaller or smaller nations really innovate with this. Uh, consensus is we are an official advisor to the government of Dubai, um, to the city of Dubai in their quest to be entirely run on a blockchain by 2020. Yeah, there's some problems with that. There's indefinite problems with that, but it's cool. Like it's cool to see smaller organizations, cities, you know, villages taking the taking the lead on this innovation and saying, okay, we don't need a national government tells we can become more efficient with this. We're going to be the tester ground for this. Um, Sony is doing it. Uh, the Norwegian government, uh, Innovation Norway, they're working. They're actually working with UN Women right now to an extent. Um, Innovation Norway set aside a 20 million kroner fund to invest in blockchain for social impact projects. That is a federal government of a relatively major state saying, like, "Hey, this we believe in this. We're going to put forward funds to do this." Um, I, in the past, in the past six months, the World Bank has launched a blockchain lab. There are 10 or 15 UN agencies looking at blockchain. Um, the State Department had a uh, an appointed official, an undersecretary of the state, speak about blockchain. 2018 and this movement uh, towards governance is coming, but we're not, I don't think we're going to see any serious governance level blockchain in the future. I think we're going to avoid the governance side of the technology for, for quite a bit. Um, and I also pretty firmly believe that organizations like UNDP like the World Food Organ, who are kind of have already taken the step to do this, are going to be the drivers behind the growth of this technology. Um, uh, blockchain ideated, it was, you know, first came out, it was a way to buy drugs on the internet. Like that's, that's what it was at first. Um, that mentality of like it being at the base of society is not something we should ever lose. And I think you guys play a really big part in that. Um, if we uh, just talk about price and talk about the SEC and what the SEC said yesterday and JP Morgan talking about Bitcoin, we don't want to let those types of organizations drive the dialogue. Um, we don't want to end up with a tool that's just recreating the system that was supposed to, to equalize. So it's really important that UNICEF build stuff in blockchain. It's really important that we are doing stuff that has tangible social impact with the technology and not just using it as a piece of fintech. Yep. I have a quick question. Could you speak a bit more to, to the fact that 
Actually, what kind of questions should organizations like UNDP be asking to evaluate uh, distributed ledger technologies? Yeah. From the security due diligence, due diligence to technology due, due, so due diligence. So, on the security side, um, most of the issues you're going to run into, especially if you try to deploy stuff around the ground, are probably going to be identity based. So, how are, how are the private keys managed? How are, are you guys the identity manager? Are you, are you going to let people control their own identity? Um, Number one, like that—that that is the biggest danger. And anything you're gonna do is it something like like A Tech, what you guys are doing with UNDP? Um, sorry, what you guys are doing in Serbia with A Tech? You just can't hand over access to their information. Yeah, like it's too dangerous to give someone control of their identity because what's to stop Joe Schmo from hitting them in the head with a baseball bat and taking that information? Not a lot. Yet. Identity. How do you protect identity? How do you store identity? What does it mean? Uh, if you're looking at identity, how much access to what information is stored around that do negative actors have, everyone have, start with identity. But then maybe even before that, if you're looking at a blockchain project, go through, like if you think you have a use case, sit down with somebody who really understands the technology for a week, like a, a week minimum, and just talk through that use case and the potential problems. Um, a lot of people right now are looking to tack on blockchain their projects because it's this cool, sexy thing. It's in the news. It's got all these cool implications. And like, oh, we can do this because this is something we do. It's like, yes, you are a supply chain manager. However, you're not losing any goods in the supply chain. Why are you spending money on this? Make sure you need it before you build it. Because if you don't need it, you can use those funds to do something else that can help people. Um, it's also really important that, again, you are looking at the technology with a lot of skepticism. Like you should look at it and, and like we, we do something we call chaos monkeying, where we design something, we spend three, four, five hours in a room just going through every way we think we could break this system. That's a huge part of your design process. Um, be like, put yourself in the mindset of the malicious actor in the region, understand their capabilities, understand the way they may interact with this technology. Try to start thinking about ways that they're gonna they're gonna look at it, they're gonna take it, and they're gonna co-opt it. And you haven't even thought about that. Like, you have to put yourself in the headset of people who are trying to break this at all times, or in the way that people are going to say, like, okay, like we built this payment system. I can use it for X, but I could also use it to ship drugs across, you know, 17 countries and have no one be able to catch me. Think about that, um, and, and and that should also inform, like, if you're going to pull the trigger on a blockchain project, especially in the development world. And I feel like I've said this four times now. Spend a month, spend three weeks, whatever it is, going through the worst case scenario. If you're not happy at the end of that, don't build it. <coughs> um, that's something we need to understand as a space is that not everything should be built. Um, and also make sure you have a really good smart contract audit team looking at all of your contracts um, and test them on the test net and just really do proper technical due diligence as well. Um, Problems arise in blockchain solutions. You look at things like the Mt. Gox hack or the recent parity hacks. It's not a problem with the protocol of the platform, of like the Ethereum platform. It tends to be a lack of diligence done by the teams who build them. Um, when something like like when with the Equifax breach, we didn't blame the internet. We blamed Equifax. Think about it that way. You're building applications. The fault point is probably going to be in the application, not in the Ethereum protocol itself. So spend a lot of time going over what you build <laughs> as an application. So I have three questions, but before I do, does anybody else have questions? Uh, we have about 12 minutes left. And do we have any questions online as well, Gemma, if you can let me know. Yeah. Um, your question, any more questions? Two, excellent. So should we start in the back? Sure. Um, so I, I come from uh, the NYU's Gavala we work on blockchain for identity. And one of the ideas that we're kind of playing around with is as we move to a more decentralized system for identity and as um, kind of legacy systems for authorizing, verifying identities kind of the wayside, our hunch is that new types of intermediaries are going to arise in their place. A hundred percent. What you, if you've thought about what those might yeah. be. Yeah, like. so in the lens of identity, um, something like self-sovereign identity is awesome, is it really safe to have everyone have complete control over their identity? Is that something you guys trust yourselves with to a full extent, like total control over whoever has access, whatever? Maybe some people do, maybe some people won't. Um, there's been a concept that's around called identity banks. Um, you store your private keys in some intermediary, they get some amount of fee, significantly less than 
you know, a traditional banking system where you're storing all your money, whatever it is. However, you, due to the nature of it, uh, you can say like, hey, here is my identity. You can try and make money off it. I'm going to get X amount of those fees and returns. You can set up that deal with them. But you'll also be able to verify like as an individual, like a, almost like a 2FA on that identity check. So if there is going to be a misuse, you have to verify every time your identity is used in a way. But you're not risking handing over identity to someone else because all you're doing is pressing yes or no, this is a good idea. You're not punching in all your information. You don't even know, need to know what your public private keys are. Um, we talk about disintermediating banks. Are we ever going to delete the banking system? No, of course not. Um, that's crazy. Maybe in 200 years, if we're around. Um, I, I think if we talk about blockchain and like what a smart contract is, it is uh, a way to move value. It's an automated way to move value. The way that in the current system we rely on bankers, lawyers, and accountants. Um, I think we're going to start to see intermediaries arise who tend to do a lot more of the philosophical thinking and the moral thinking about whether or not something is right and should be built, because they don't need to be the ones actually doing the work to move it. Um, I think that'll be really interesting. I, and I also don't think we know enough about the technology or the way people are going to use it to fully understand the way it's going to work. And I also think we're at a, a point in time right now where this could all be co-opted by big corporations and it could kill it. Um, we don't build public trust in it. We're never going to reach you know, the point where we even have to have this conversation. Because if JP Morgan, if Jamie Dimon is coming out saying Bitcoin's a fraud and the price drops $2,000 and then JP Morgan subsidiaries buy millions and millions of dollars of Bitcoin and then all of a sudden Bitcoin's at $70,000 and look how rich all those banks are. Um, wow, nobody wants that. Like, nobody wants JP Morgan to get richer, especially not on the back end of a technology that was made to distribute that wealth more equitably. So we have to be really careful. Um, we have to make sure that we keep the ethos of the technology facing the right direction. And again, you guys are going to be a huge part of that, especially if you're working on projects like the Wolf Program, like like UNDP, like UNICEF. Like that is going to be how we stop the big bad banks from co-opting this and using it as a tool to, to like keep screwing people over. Um, and that's that's like a very sorry. Am I going to get anyone in trouble with that? Um, uh, this is this. There comes a point in time where it gets very passionate um, because it's. It's really, really dangerous, and we're not, we're explorers. We have no idea what's beyond the horizon. But luckily, we're in a place where we can build our own future. We just have to do it properly. Yeah. So when you, when you say that, right, um, it sounds incredibly risky. It's so risky. So what I understand now, though, is that there would be efficiency gains, would yeah. be one thing, right? There would be more equal distribution of value mm -hmm. and possibly be more transparent? Definitely be more transparent. So we already know that we can do efficiency and transparency. That's like lowest hanging fruit. That's something the technology can come in and do today. That's good for everyone. Um, that's really valuable right now, but that's just the start. And I think we have that base. It's like, it's like I know that um, we can work with the Red Cross to make their aid distribution more transparent. We can make sure that donors are able to track where their funds are going. We can make sure that funds are being properly used. Cool. That is, again, like that's the lowest hanging fruit. That's the least we can do with this technology. We know we can do it well. We should be doing it as much as possible. But we're going to keep exploring. We're going to see what, like, what does that mean? Like, OK, it's like when we start to make things more transparent, what new possibilities arise? Um, you're going to start to see blockchain and AI coupled. You're going to start to see blockchain and machine learning coupled. Um, there's a project that I was, uh, someone was talking about, and it's, and it's an agricultural project revolving around agricultural drones. Each drone is basically a node attached to a blockchain um, as they're just like doing their drone stuff in the fields, whether it's culling wheat or turning over soil. I don't, not a fun word. Um, uh, as it's going through, they may encounter problems. Like those drones may have to learn how to move, maneuver around a rock. Machine learning comes in. After they bump into a rock eight or nine times, they learn just to scoot three inches to the left. They go around their business. That, as a node, that information is stored on that drone, which is a node, and shared with all of the other nodes across the globe. So if, I, if I'm a drone or I own a drone in Bolivia that runs into a rock and it learns how to get around it, instantaneously a drone in, in, in Bangladesh knows how to get around the same problem. 
And we're going to start to know more about what this technology can do as it begins to get coupled with other really cool things. Um, and I think, again, we don't know what any of this means yet. And I can't stress that enough. Like, we're learning, 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 and we should be learning together. Precisely. OK, so when then comes the point where I would advise, for example, a government to you know, now establish a, you know, put the new property registration system on the blockchain? I mean, what you're telling me is that the risks right now are un... You're going to be able to prove it when other, so, so there are risk takers. There are already people who have stepped and taken these risks. And um, Dubai, so Estonia was maybe the first one, and they didn't take that big of a risk because they did it privately, they did it controlled. Dubai is doing it a little bit more publicly on a public chain. That's a much bigger risk. If they prove that that works, then you'll start to see other people look at it. Um, I don't think, you will never be able to go to somebody and say, hey, you should be the first person to do this. Or you might be able to, but that's going to be a lot harder than you, there needs to be a wealth of proof of concepts deployed behind us, which is what we're building now. And we're not talking about market ready production. Like we're not talking about large systems. We're talking about tiny proof of concepts. That's a that's what's being built right now. Proof that this works is what's being built right now. Assumptions are being tested. That's going to start to inform what we can do. And you'll see governments start with the lowest hanging fruit. They're going to start with efficiency. They're going to start with transparency and they're going to go from there. But that's a really good start. Um, so I yeah. just want to make a couple of points. So what we're finding, I think, as UNDP, as other UN agencies and governments are coming to us saying, well, we're seeing blockchain being deployed in our countries. Chile is already using it for its stock exchange. It's been using it for a number of other reasons. What are the risks that are associated with it, with our governance systems? What is going to be exposed? So it's really interesting for us, like you said, hey, we need to work with the developers yeah. to give us a couple of scenarios of, you know, in your mind, what would it look like? everything from an ethics board that's a joint ethics board with technology developers and UN systems with government mm -hmm. to other scenarios of actually managing expected risk that continue to grow. And also um, what you're going to see is you're not going to see like governments, big agencies are not going to be the early adopters. Um, that's way too risky for them. It's going to happen at the grassroots level. These products that are like remittance projects is um, UNOPS's uh, Nepal Home Office was looking at a blockchain based project to Reduce the amount of uh, reduce the fees on remain or reduce remittances that were coming in from the uh, from the Nepalese diaspora. It's going to start in the fringes, and the fringes have the most space for innovation, um, and it's going to start at the bottom. We're going to start seeing projects. We are seeing projects that are focused on helping the lowest, the most endangered, the most vulnerable people, and that's what's going to prove it to to the government. On. Fortunately, that's also the riskiest place. Um, we shouldn't absolutely not be testing stuff in Somalia. We should not be testing stuff in Syria. Um, I think a really good question to look at when, when you ask about questions to ask stuff about blockchain, like literally look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People are hungry. If they don't have shelter, blockchain's not going to solve their problems. You need to focus on solving those problems first. Um, so there's a really kind of niche market for this, which is uh, I actually think Jordan is a, the, the Azure camp is a pretty good example. It's a relatively stable and secure location with vulnerable populations that are being helped. There's a reason why it wasn't deployed uh, in Syria. And we need to be really careful where we do these tests and experiments. Because um, if we, someone once asked me, uh, you know, we should build a blockchain solution to help entrepreneurs in Somalia. Great. Cool. I don't know what that means yet, but let's talk about it. What is the entrepreneurial community like in Somalia? Lacking. There are a lot of other issues that need to be solved first, and blockchain is not going to solve all of them. Not even close. Um, so again, we just need to focus on what it can do. And the more we build with what it can do, the more it will be able to do. It, I'm, I hate to, to talk about it this way, but like, it's a child. It is a child. Um, it's going to grow, it's going to learn, it's going to fail, it's going to hurt itself, it's going to hurt other people, it's going to do some really cool things. We need to do our best to guide its growth safely, securely, and as it takes small steps forward, it's going to get bigger and better. And that, that just, I think that just is the best way to think about it, is that we're not dealing with something that's by any means ready for widespread adoption. Um, but we're starting to see the path. 
So we have 45 more seconds. And one last question, or are you good? Um, could you talk a little bit more about the potential benefits um, so I mentioned the transparency and efficiency of the uh, to the kind of proven over and over this inclusion? Yeah. So benefits, I mean like public blockchain, if you're running a node, anybody running, anyone can boot up a node, you can launch it on your MacBook, please don't do it, you will kill all the Wi-Fi in this building. Um, once you have that node up and running, you can go in, you can look at every transaction. So you're not necessarily saying, you don't necessarily see exactly what the transaction was, you don't see what it was for, but if I, uh, if I am transparency, peer-to-peer -peer connection, I send you money, anyone else uh, there's a hash of that transaction. That hash is our digital representation that that transaction occurred. Um, anyone else can go and look at the system and compare my hash that I have, that I say came from it, with the actual hash on chain. It's time stamped, it's there. You can just look at a representation that this did occur. No, I guess my question was not, I, I understand the transparency. I think those are all established. Yeah. But you said they were the lower the groups. So yes. I want to know what's beyond those. Oh, uh, those? identity. And then protection of identity. So uh, one of the reasons why identity is really dangerous right now is because we don't know how to uh, stop someone who's looking at your identity from getting all of the information. So there are things called zero knowledge proofs which are coming in, which are verifications that you are who you say you are and you're a trusted source, but you don't need to give over any actual information. So if I'm going to take out a bank loan, um, the bank doesn't need to know my medical history. They just need to know that I'm a trustworthy to pay them back. So we are in the process, the technology, the protocol is coming in to create ways to validate this information without actually having to share it. Um, that is like one of the coolest, keyest things coming in. Um, uh, access to wholesale energy, easily transferred energy, um, carbon credits, carbon credit reduction, the protection of natural resources based on contracts. Um, we're all we're starting to see a lot of this. These ideas be postulated. We're seeing papers being written. We're seeing proof of concepts being developed. Um, but they're all still they're not scalable yet, and they're not scalable yet because of the technology. And then one of the biggest issues you run into with any blockchain solution is the the light. Once you're off chain, like last mile verification is huge. Um, last mile verification is like what initiates anything on the contract, and a lot of that can't be solved by technology. Um, you can start to incentivize people to do the right thing, but uh, you're, we're going to continuously run into human issues, and we need to be cognizant of that. Um, and like, what's holding us back is almost as much, I mean, it is entirely as much a misunderstanding of the way policies are going to interact with this, the way uh, different agencies are going to interact with this stuff, as it is the actual technical aspect. So we're still like that. That's why it's so important that we explore it with you guys, because um, otherwise we're going to start building stuff, and you're going to say, "What the hell is this? We don't want to use this." Um, we had a question. We had a token question yesterday, and someone was like, "We should use a token." And they were like, "There are seven different actors in this potential project: agencies, big enterprises, individuals on the ground, NGOs, and foundations, uh, and a couple other whatever they were." They're like, yeah, we're going to use a token for X, Y, Z. We're like, okay. Do you have any idea how those different agencies are going to interact with that token? No. Full stop. No token. We need to understand how people. Like we literally need to understand how people are going to use this, um, and that ch it changes on a case by case basis. The same way it does with any application. Um, this is just more software that happens to be about connecting people to each other and not connecting them to some sort of larger entity. That's that's like that's the core of it. Uh, but that changes a lot of social dynamics. And we can theorize on what these next steps are, but we're not going to get there without experimenting. And we're not going to experiment without failing. And we're going to see a lot of really cool things happen. But nobody knows the potential of this yet. Nobody knows how this is going to be used. Nobody knows the negative outcomes of it. We're going to get there. We just have to focus on the lowest hanging fruit first. <laughs> So with that, I'm going to say a big, big thank you uh, to Ben. Um, and I wanted to share two things. So th that was amazing. So thank you so much for like bearing it out uh, and telling us how it actually works. 
So for those of you who have signed up, thank you so much. We will share your presentation if that's okay, because yeah, it has fine. definition to just a lot more. remind us. Uh, and we also have a webcast this talk, so it will be archived. We will send you the video of it. Um, we do have a new center that goes out every month of case studies, everything from blockchain to other types of technology, things that keep us up at night. Uh, so if you would um, like to sign up for it, once we send this out to you and you don't receive it, let us know. We'd be happy to add you to the list. And thank you so much for spending your lunch with us and have a very, very happy holiday.